Here you own, yes. and I can put it in the yes. package. You guys are on now. Oh, well, this is not. Um, this is not working very much, but um, I don't think so. It was before, but. I think this is not working, or is this? This to sim. Maybe I have to press uh, on at some point, or you just have to click. Ah, okay. You're not trying. Ah, great. Thanks. It was very easy. Yeah, definitely. Good. Okay, everyone. Let's uh, let's let's start. We're a little behind. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce my my good friend Carlos Palazuelos, visiting all the way from Madrid, uh, where he's currently at Universidad Complutense in Madrid, and he even did his PhD work even there. Yes, uh, Carlos is visiting us uh, to Urbana. He'll be here for quite some time, and he was here quite a long time ago. Yeah, 14, fourteen years, years ago, probably before a number of us were here. Even yeah, so good. Um, and he's going to talk about quantum entanglement versus classical communication to play XOR games. Yes? Very good. Carlos? OK. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's very nice to stay here. As Roy mentioned, I was here uh, doing a postdoc. And so in some sense, I find many things very familiar. Um, so I have prepared a talk, which I think is very basic. I hope it's not too basic. But since uh, the audience um, seems to be like very general i didn't want to go into too much detail but i wanted to uh present like a research line and maybe some results that we have got in this line but since i'm going to be here until the end of june uh, and in case you are interested in more details i will be super happy to to discuss many things okay well so regarding the topic of the of the talk um this is entanglement versus classical communication but i would say that um the it it focus on a more general question, which is like, we want to compare quantum resources uh, and classical resources, okay, which would be a very general problem in quantum information. And here, I'm going to study that problem um, in the language of games. Okay, so the first I'm going to do is to explain what a game is, and then we will see what kind of results we want, we want to study, okay? So I'm going to study like the most simple games, which are called XOR games. And in these games, we have a referee and we have two players. Let's say that the players are Alice and Bob, okay? So the referee is going to ask some questions to the players. And after that, the players must answer some outputs. So in this case, I'm going to consider that um, the questions um, made by the referee are going to go from one to n. So we have n possible questions for Alice and n possible questions for Bob. But the answers of the players are going to be just uh, one or minus one. Okay, so only two possible answers per player. And that is uh, a simplification of a more general game where uh, we could consider many more questions, for instance. Okay, so which are, are the elements uh, which define the game? Two elements. We want to define the probability distribution over the set of questions. So how the referee is going to choose the pair of questions to be asked. And second point, we are going to consider some um, signs, this uh, Cij plus one minus one, which is going to be used in order to define the winning probability of the game. So if the referee asks questions Ij, I to Alice and J to Bob, according to the probability distribution pi, and the players answer A and B, we will say that they win the game if and only if the product of the outputs, the product of A and B, matches the sign of the uh, IJ. Okay, that is a game, right? So which are the rules in order to play this game? So there are like one rule. They cannot communicate to each other once the game has started. So Alice cannot tell Bob which uh, answers he received and the other way around. But what they can do is to agree on a strategy before the game has started so that they know what the other person is going to answer depending on the question 
um, the receipt. Okay. And this strategy is going to be defined by means of what I have written here, shared resources. Okay. Depending on the resources that we allow to the players in order to play the game, they will be able to perform some strategies or some other. We could talk, for instance, about classical resources, or we could talk, for instance, about quantum resources. We will go over that later. Okay. So if you see this game, it is very easy to see that these games can always be, can always be won with probability a half. Why? Because Alice could just um, answer one with probability half and minus one with probability half. Same for Bob. That is a very nice strategy. But you see that 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 you see that since the only condition that we uh, they have to get is that the product is uh, assigned, half of the time they will win, and half of the time they will lose. Okay. So the probability of winning these games is always at least a half. That is the reason why, in general, we don't work with the probability, with the winning probability, but with the so-called bias of the game, which is the difference uh, between the winning probability that they can attain uh, and the naive uh, probability that they would obtain if they do something kind of stupid. OK? So as I was saying, we want to use these kind of games in order to compare quantum resources and classical resources. OK, so we are going to consider classical strategies and quantum strategies, and we will study which is the best probability of winning of the best bias, which um, each of these um, resources, okay? So what is a quantum, or, so what is a classical probability, so a classical strategy? Well, a classical strategy is going to be defined by some rules that they will do, but at the end, um, the only thing I care about is the probability of answer, um, each of the answers, let's say. OK, so we do care about the probability of answering A and B if they have been asked by the questions uh, I and J. OK, so if, we, so if we consider classical resources, those probabilities are going to be written in this way. That means that Alice will answer something, Bob will answer something, and uh, they will be independent. Here I'm simplifying things a little bit because if you want to consider the most general strategies, you should um, allow the players to use something called shared randomness. They could share um, some classical probability distribution in order to uh, perform their uh, strategies. The problem is that mathematically, that is going to be translated into considering convex combinations of these elements. And since we, are, we want to optimize something which is linear on this element, taking convex combination is not going to help at all. So what I'm saying is that here I'm not writing the possibility of using shared randomness, but writing it uh, wouldn't change anything. Okay, the optimization of all strategies uh, wouldn't change at all. Okay, so what is a quantum strategy? Well, a quantum strategy is just that we are going to allow the players to um, um, share a quantum state, a bipartite quantum state, and they are going to answer depending on a measurement that they will perform on their corresponding particle. That means that uh, they can, before the game has started, they could meet, they could produce a bipartite state, two particle states, and this will keep one of these particles, Bob will keep another particle, and they will separate. And then when they receive the corresponding questions, they will perform a measurement on those particles, and depending on the result of those measurements, of those measurements, they will answer uh, the question. Right, that is uh, what they could do if you if if we allow them to use quantum entanglement. Okay, so um, there exists a very famous game which is called CHSHK, which is uh, defined by only two possible question questions per player. So I and Y go from one to two. Uh, the probability distribution that we uh, consider in order to choose the question is the uniform one. So the four possible questions have probability one over four. And uh, the signs which are going to define the winning probability um, are the following. So all the questions are going to be associated to the sign minus one up to one of the question, which is uh, the other sign. OK? So there are three questions associated to one sign and one question associated to the other. Right? So if you check the largest winning probability by using classical resources, you can see that uh, is three out of four. That means that since in three out of four questions, they have to 
produce the sign uh, minus one, they could agree that Alice will always um, output one and Bob will always output minus one. So that the product will be always minus one. That means that three out of three cases, uh, they will win, but in one case, they will lose. So that is a classical strategy which performs this probability. And it is not difficult to see that that is the best they can do. And it is not difficult to see because uh, the determine. So if you want to optimize overall possible classical probability distributions, uh, you can see that you just need to check the extreme points of the set of classical probability distributions. And the extreme points is a finite set, so you can check all of them and then you compare them. Okay, but it turns out that if you allow them to use uh, entanglement, so if they can, in particular, they can share an EPR, a bipartite state in dimension two, they can, they can produce some measurements so that the winning probability is slightly better than the one for the classical value. Okay, in this case, they obtain this um, probability, which in terms of the bias is 0 0.35, which is larger than uh, a 1 over 4. So that means that um, game can be won with higher probability if we allow the players to use um, share um, entanglement um, compared to if they just use classical um, strategies. Okay. So I'm I'm explaining all these things in terms of games, and it looks like a very simple scenario. But this is a very deep result. This was actually um, this is a translation uh, to something called violations of Bell inequalities, and this means that. Um, in nature, we can produce distributions by terms of, of by means of measurements, which cannot be explained by classical mechanics, or if you want to be more formal, by a local hidden variable model. And it has like this is very important from a foundational point of view of quantum mechanics. But actually, these kind of um, effects are behind many applications in quantum information. For, example, for instance, quantum cryptography, the generation of randomness, all these um, applications of quantum information in many cases are based on the fact that um, 13 probability, quantum probability distributions cannot be explained by means of classical theory. Okay, In terms of games, we just said that we win the game with a high probability if we use quantum resources. Okay? Well, the point is that if you uh, understand this game in terms of uh, how better quantum mechanics is compared to the classical mechanics, you will say, well, I would like to have games for, for which the quantum value is much larger than the classical value. Because in some sense, we would be quantifying how better quantum mechanics is compared to the classical mechanics. Okay? And there is a limitation here, who, which was proved by Cyrilson, um, namely that uh, since we have seen that for this game, uh, the quotient between the quantum and the classical can be larger than one, um, it can be proved that independently of the size of these games, independently of the number of questions, independently of how, how complicated uh, we want to define a game, if, if, if it is of this form, the quotient is going to be always um, upper bounded by a constant, which is in particular smaller than two. And that was proof because Cyrilson realized that uh, this uh, quantum value and classical value could be, could be translated into 13 norms, which are very important in functional analysis. And he realized that then he could apply a fundamental result in Banach space theory, which is Grothendieck's inequality, which tells us exactly that this question is upper bounding. Okay? So it was like the first time that uh, quantum information really um, used um, deep results from local theory of Banach spaces in order to state a result. Yep. In, I, I'm not restricted. I mean, this upper bound uh, is independently of the dimension. In this case of games, you can actually see that uh, if you have n questions um, in order to, to, in the game, I mean, if the game is defined with n questions, you can always restrict the dimension of the entangled state. So. Uh, the best you can do is like two to the n or something like that. So you can always stay in finite dimension in case in this case. But in principle, I will not restrict to finite dimension. Okay. Okay. So if we come back to our original question, um, we wanted to um, compare quantum and classical results. And in fact, if we are working in quantum information, it's not that we want to compare. We want to prove that quantum mechanics is better than classical mechanics. And here we have seen that we have some examples for which 
quantum resources are better than classical resources, but we have two uh, complaints that we could we could make. The first one is that we have seen that they are better, but they cannot be much better if we are playing this kind of games. And the second complaint is even deeper. We could say that we are comparing quantum entanglement, and we have said with classical resources, but what classical resources means. For instance, here, I'm, I, I have said that they cannot communicate to each other. But if you want to prove that quantum entanglement is much better than classical resources, you could say, well, I want to prove that quantum mechanics is actually much better than even classical communication. That would be much more surprising. But here we have not considered this. In fact, if we want to consider that problem, the first we would need to uh, define is the bias or the probability, the winning probability of the games if we allow the players to use classical communication between them. But here we start having some problems. For instance, what is classical communication? Do we mean that Alice can send information to Bob? Bob can send information to Alice, or is both? In case of both, how many rounds uh, do we permit? Uh, we have to uh, clarify this point. For the moment, let me just um, denote uh, this beta one way uh, if we allow one of them send information to the other and the second in order to allow them to uh, communicate uh, in two way independently of the number of rounds with not bound at all, okay? So the first thing that we want to, or we would like to prove is like, let's try to compare the quantum bias with this kind of bias. But we realize that then we have to consider a more complicated type of games, because if we are with classical games, if we are dealing with classical games, we will not be able to improve those strategies uh, where we allow one of them uh, to send information because if I ask a question to Alice and another question to Bob, Alice could send her question to Bob so that Bob has all the information of the game. So we will not be able to define a strategy which is better than that, better than the fact that one of them has all the information, right? So in some sense, if we want to compare quantum entanglement and classical communication, we should consider some contexts which are a little bit more complicated than classical actual games. On the other hand, I have um, written, so what I have written here is that if you consider um, classical communication in order to play a classical show games, the quantum value will be always worse than the two-way. Actually, it will be even worse than the one-way because what I'm saying is that if Alice can communicate her question to Bob, you will not improve that at all. Okay, so we want to go to another scenario where we where we can compare quantum entanglement and classical communication, but we look for the simplest scenario because you could imagine that if, for instance, um, I ask Alice and Bob to create entanglement from nothing, that is a scenario where I will prove that entanglement is much better than classical communication because with classical communication, they cannot create entanglement. So if I'm free to... Um, suggest any possible task, it is very easy to suggest a task where quantum entanglement can be much better than classical communication. But I want to uh, um, propose a task so that it is not clear whether classical communication can help at all. We will see now in a moment. And on the other hand, ideally, we would look for in a scenario where we can prove that quantum strategies are much better than classical strategies, meaning, meaning in terms of games that the quantum bias of the game is actually much larger than the classical bias. Yeah. This is a short game, but what I'm saying is that um, the, the first uh, equation is telling us that if we want to study these kind of problems, classical short games will not help because you will not improve classical communication if you are using classical games, if you are using classical questions. Okay? So what we are going to do is to um, go to the quantum XR games to the case of quantum XR games. So these games are pretty similar to the one I have explained before. They were introduced by other Dreyke and Thomas Biddick. And what we are going to replace is the question. So the questions, instead of asking questions like by means of classical information, sending X to Alice and Y to Bob, what the referee is going to do is to prepare a quantum state, a bipartite quantum state, and he will send one particle to Alice and one particle to Bob. That means that the question are going to be described by bipartite quantum states. 
Okay, the rest is similar. So here the questions will be: We have a family, let's say a finite family of uh, bipartite states. We will have also a probability um, on the possible states to be chosen, and the answers are going to be a, 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 a and b minus one one, and we will have some signs. And again, we will ask: They will answer plus one minus one. We will take the product and we will see if the product uh, matches the signs. Uh, that we have uh, defined in the game. It's just that we have um, replaced uh, the way of asking the question. Now, uh, we don't ask X and Y, but we ask particle X to Alice, particle Y to Bob, um, which are the register of a bipartite. Okay, and if you think about that, now it's not clear if classical communication would, could help at all, because the fact that Alice can communicate classical information to Bob doesn't allow her to send all the information and code it into a particle. Okay, so it's not clear at all. So, well, as before in this case, uh, you can see that um, um, this is always, I mean, you, you, you can always win the probability with probability health precisely for the same reason as before. They can just answer randomly um, and they will match half of the time. So we are... Mm, uh, interested in considering the bias. This is just a technical issue to have something which can be, like the quotient can be larger. Okay. Okay, so what do we know about this game? So uh, this game ha have been studied before and we know that there exists a family of games, of quantum actual games, for which the quotient between the quantum value, the quantum bias, and the classical bias uh, is uh, larger or equal square root of m. This family is indexed in n. So if you uh, let n tend to infinity, this will go to infinity. That means that we have a family of quantum games such that the quantum bias over the classical bias can be arbitrarily large. Okay, in order to play these games, if you want to compare class strategies with no communication with quantum strategies, so uh, in terms of sharing a bipartite state, you can uh, get unbounded um, advantages, let's say. So which is, so how is this family of games defined? In fact, they are pretty easy. So in this kind of games, we just uh, need to consider two possible questions, two possible states, okay? So we have this uh, first state, which is the zero, zero plus a maximum entangled state in dimension N with the proper normalization. And the second state, the second question, uh, the referee can ask to the player, is going to be the same, but where we have replaced one plus with a minus, okay? The probability distribution that uh, the referee is going to follow is just the uniform one. With probability a half, he will ask the first state. With probability a half, he will ask the second state. And the signs are the only one because if, if, if both were equal, the, the product would be trivial, right? Now, if you see this state, you can see that they are orthogonal. So you could say, well, but if they are orthogonal, I can actually um, distinguish them. But be careful, because if you want to distinguish two states, you have to perform a general measurement. So you can distinguish these states if you are allowed to use global measurements on the global system. But if one particle is um, in, in Alice part and the other particle is in Bob part, we will not be able to apply global unitaries. We will just able um, to um, apply unitaries of the form U tensor V. And it is not clear that they can distinguish these states uh, by, by means of those um, measurements, okay? So it can be seen that for um, this state, um, uh, for this game, if you consider the classical bias, uh, that is always um, smaller than one over square root of n. In particular, one can prove that it is one uh, over two square root of n. In this case, it is not so easy to have like a general feeling about why, why so, but mathematically it's really a argument. It's just that the Cochise bath inequality and you can see that um, this is the best you can, at least this is the upper bound, and then you can easily find the proper strategy which um, uh, reach this, this way. Okay, yeah.
Yeah, but here I'm not here I'm not um right, but here I'm not al allowing classical communication yet. So so this this uh, beta g is is the the one defined before. It's just that Alice can perform a measurement on one part, Bob's can, Bob can perform another measurement on the part, and nothing else. So for the moment, I'm not allowing classical communication between them. Okay, this is what I'm going to study, but for the moment, I cannot. Okay, uh, what I'm saying is that here you are comparing like uh, independent measurements on each part with uh, the use of an entangled state and measurement. Okay, as we did in the classical case. Okay, so if you if they can perform independent measurements uh, on each part, uh, this is the bias. While you can see that the quantum bias of the game uh, is uh, one over two, that means that this game can be won with probability one if we allow for uh, quantum resources, for um, the share of a bipartite quantum state. In fact, I'm not going to explain this very much, but in fact, you can see that <clears throat> this game is very uh, nice because it shows very interesting properties that you can see when you pass from classical lecture games to quantum lecture games. For instance, in order to attain the um, the quantum bias, so in order to win the game with probability one, they do need to consider infinite dimension, which is related to your previous question. In the classical case, finite dimension, finite dimension is always enough in order to get the best value with quantum resources. Here, you do need infinite dimension in order to win the game with probability one. Okay, that is the first thing. And the second thing is that one could say, well, okay, you can win with probability one, but what kind of states you have to use, quantum states, in order to win the probability the, the game with probability one? And actually, one could say, well, the maximally entangled state that is the like the most quantum state. So I would expect that uh, if they can win the game. Um, with probability one by using quantum resources, the, the bipartite state they are using is in some sense some kind of maximum entangled state. But you can see that you cannot win the game with maximum entangled state. In fact, you can see that if you restrict the quantum value of the game to the family of maximum entangled state without, I mean, without um, upper bounded the dimension, you cannot get much better than classical strategies. So in order to win this game, not just to win, in order to get really advantages over classical resources, you do need to consider some other states. Maximum entangled states are not good for this state. And the reason, the mathematical reason behind that result is that uh, you can apply a non-commutative Grothendieck inequality in order to prove that if you restrict to maximum entangled state, the quantum value cannot be much larger than the classical value in the same way uh, as we saw for classical game. But it's just that for classical game, it applied to every quantum state, while here, the non-commutative version of Grothendieck's inequality would apply just to the restriction of maximum entangled state, which is, from a mathematical point of view, you, you, you understand why, but from a physical point of view, I find it very counterintuitive, right? But, okay, so, uh, so this is like the motivation of the result uh, or, or, or the, the, the problem that I wanted to bring here. So, uh, and now the, the point is, can we use these kind of games in order to prove, for instance, that quantum entanglement can be much better than classical communication? We have seen that with these games, we can prove that quantum entanglement is much better than classical resources, right? Classical resources are understood in terms of just um, restricting Alice and Bob to different uh, to independent measurements, so to product to product measurements, let's say. But now we want to add classical communication, and we want to understand if by using classical communication, you can still prove that quantum entanglement is much better than this uh, new bias. Okay. And the first result that I'm going to present is that you cannot. Okay. So this is a joint uh, um, result with Maris Junge, with Alex Kubicki and with Ignacio Villanueva. And here we prove that there exists a universal constant K such that uh, for every bipartite quantum X short game, the quantum bias of the game is always upper bounded by K times uh, the one-way classical communication. That means that if we allowed either 
Alice sending information to Bob, or Bob sending information to Alice, but we don't need the two way, just one way is enough. Then whatever you can do with quantum resources can be done with this classical communication up to maybe a constant. Okay. So this is bad news in the sense that we are looking for um, a context where uh, we can prove that quantum entanglement is much better than even classical communication. What we are uh, stating here is that um, if you state in the context of bipartite quantum extra games, that is not enough. This is not uh, complicated enough in order to um, get uh, all the power of quantum entanglement compared to classical communication. Or maybe it's just that quantum entanglement was not as powerful as we were thinking before, because you can actually do the same with classical communication. Okay, So uh, just some comments about uh, this result. So first of all, have in mind that here, we are not saying that. Um, so th there is a difference with the case of classical games. In classical games, we prove that quantum couldn't be much larger than classical, but classical is always um, worse than class than quantum. Okay, so whatever you can do classically, you can do quantum, and we want to see if we can do better. So here, it is not true that whatever you can do with one-way communication can be done with quantum. That is not. In what I'm saying is that the one-way classical value yes, can be for some games much larger than the quantum bias. This is very easy to understand. Consider a classical game so that the quantum bias is small, but for classical games, one-way communication is the best. You win with probability one, and every classical game can be encoded as a quantum game. It's a particular case of quantum game. So what I'm saying is that for some quantum games, one-way classic communication is much better, much higher than a quantum. Okay, what I'm saying here is that you will not find any game for which quantum can be much better than classical. That cannot happen in this context. Yeah? No, uh, K is uniform. Is uh, I will I will say now in the in the next thing. So for in our proof we got K eight uh, F square root of two. That is not optimal at all, but it's a constant. Okay, it's probably the best constant. We don't even know if if K can be one. We, we couldn't prove that, but we don't even know. But it's completely independent of, of the game, of the dimension, of whatever. It's just a universal constant, okay? What I was saying is that uh, in our proof, we got K, um, this um, constant because of the um, results that we were using, but we don't even know if K can be one. So we don't even have an example of a quantum short game, like of a short game, such that the quantum bias can be strictly larger than the one-way bias. I believe it exists, but I was not able to, to prove it. On the other hand, I'm not saying that that question is super interesting because there are some known uh, quantum games, not XOR, but quantum games with only two possible outputs for which it is known that the quantum bias can be strictly larger than the one-way communication. So the difficult part of uh, proving constant, if constant K equal one is not enough, is that you have to define an XOR game, which is a very limited, so in a very restrictive type of games. And sometimes you cook up something, but then you impose that the, the only thing that you are going to look is at the product of the output. And then you feel that what you have constructed is not uh, good enough. Okay, But what I'm saying is that we don't know if for XOR games, uh, K is one, but we do know that for some very simple games, which are not XOR, K can, uh, the, the quantum bias can be a strictly larger than the classical bias, that, that's the one-way bias, okay? Yep. Infinite. Just one way, but infinite. There's no, there's no limit. That is a good question. Um, I would say it's of the order of the uh, number, of the dimension of the... Um, of the dimension of the the states which define the question. So if you are in CN tensor or CN, I would say it's going to be a further N. Okay, but I'm not completely sure. I'm not completely sure because um, the 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 way we prove this result is by following some sort of the same approach uh, that um, 
as follow with uh, as a series of follow. So what we did is to uh, realize uh, any quantum extra game as an element in the tensor product of two spaces. Okay, and then we identify two norms. Uh, one of them describes the quantum value or the quantum bias, and the other one describes the 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 one-way bias. And then we prove that one norm is um, smaller than or equal to a constant times the other. But there are some results um, as part of the proofs which are not completely constructed. For instance, I'm going to tell you. So we are using several times implicitly Han Banach theorem. And Han Banach is not constructed. So I'm not completely sure. I have the feeling that um, the dimension is of that order, but if you want, like, um, like, um, if you want me to be sure, I, I should check that in more detail because there is a puzzle. I mean, um, at some point, at some, at some point, instead of working on the the spaces with norms, we pass to the dual space, and I don't know exactly how the norms are related to the the construction of a one-way model in order to do that. It is. I mean, we can. I can tell you in more detail what we did, but it is not easy to see it. In fact, if you ask me, so if then this is telling me that if I have a quantum strategy, um, I I should be able to construct a a, a strategy using one-way communication, so that um, in order to play that game, I obtain the same probability up to a constant, the same bias up to a constant. I don't know how to construct that. Um, strategy. I don't know how to construct the one-way strategy from the quantum strategy because of the tools that we use in our proof. They are very much non-constructed. Maybe one can do it, but it is not definitely something that you read the proof and you get that, okay, Alice is doing this. This is not so easy. Okay. Okay. So, um, well, this is bad news in terms of, again, we are proving that quantum strategies are not as good as we were expecting, let's look at more factors. Okay, can we um, study this problem if you use or if we consider, for instance, three players? Everything is defined exactly in the same way. We will have a referee. There are three players. They will output plus one minus one. We want to uh, the probe to be something, right? Uh, but now, if we want, and the the, the quantum um, value is exactly the same. We allow them to share a tripartite quantum state. And they will perform measurements on each part, and that will be the um, quantum probability that they will use. Now, if you want to consider um, classical communication, here the situation is much more tricky because we have to consider this. Um, this already um, uh, was mentioned by by um, by you. Did you. You mentioned that it was you, right? So. Um, so then you have to consider local operations and classical communication. We were considering that before, but it was not really needed to talk about that. But here we really need to talk about that because there's no notion of one way or two way here. So if we have three people and we want to allow them to communicate uh, in a most general way they can, uh, th there's no pre-order, right? There's not a pre-order established here. So it's not that it's first Alice, second Bob, then Charlie. It's not even like that. It's like Alice will send something and depending on what she's sending, uh, it will be uh, Bob or Charlie the next in sending information. So it's kind of crazy um, define uh, this kind of protocol, right? In fact, there is a very nice um, article uh, which is called um, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About LOCC But Were Afraid to Ask, right? And, and it's a very nice paper because it shows uh, how difficult it is um, to handle these kind of strategies. And on the other hand, uh, it uh, gives um, very interesting results about um, whether you can um, have some examples for which you need infinite communication, whether if you consider the, the um, set of um, classical strategies with this LOCC operation, maybe the closure is not the set. Well, there are many interesting things about this um, kind of strategies, those strategies for which we allow the um, players to use any kind of classical communication. Uh, but the like the final output that you get is that it's difficult to deal with that. So if you want to deal with that uh, set, uh, you could say, well, I don't know. So I'm going to try to simplify that set. 
And a, a way of simplifying that set is to consider another kind of strategies, which are called separable strategies. And well, I'm not going to be very um, precise here, but the idea is that um, separable strategies are those for which the final measurements uh, made by the players are going to be restricted to be product of things. That is very general, in part classical strategies, quantum strategies, local operations and classical communication strategies can be written in this way. So it's a very general set, which in particular includes, um, no, sorry, this is, I mean, this covers classical strategies and uh, LOCC strategies, but not quantum strategies, because otherwise we wouldn't be doing anything. But what I'm saying is that this is a very big set, which um, includes local operations and classical communication. Um, so, and it is much easier to handle, to work with. The point is that since, since it is a bigger set, when we optimize over strategies from this set, when we want to compare the bias of the game or to compute the bias of the game with respect to this set, the bias is going to be larger. So we have simplified the set. Now we can really deal with these kind of measurements, but uh, we pay a price. The price is that since the set is bigger, because we want to include LOCC, that means that the bias of the game is going to be bigger, too. it's going to be larger. So if we are looking for examples where the quantum bias is, is larger than the LOCC bias, now the problem is more difficult because we are comparing with something which is even larger. It's just that now we can touch this kind of sets. So it's like a bet. You try this, if you get it, it's fine. If you don't get it, you don't know anything. Okay, so in this uh, sense, we were lucky because we could prove, and this is a recent paper joined with Marius Junge, that there exists a family of tripartite quantum uh, XOR games for which the quantum bias can be much larger than the bias with separable strategies, or in particular with LOCC strategies. So that means that we have proof here, the two results that they have presented here um, says, say that if you are in the bipartite case, the one-way communication is always better, up to maybe a constant, than a quantum strategies, than those strategies that Alice and Bob can, if you allow them to use a bipartite system. But if you go to more parties, let's say to three parties, okay, there you allow uh, the players to use a tripartite state, then you allow uh, any kind of communication, unlimited, any direction, any way, and still, if you allow that, the quantum value of the game can be much larger, can be arbitrarily larger than the classical value. So in some sense, this is telling us that although we are usually, we usually work with bipartite state because that is the easiest situation. And in fact, I could say that in terms of, I mean, that is the situation that we really understand, the bipartite case, this is telling us that if you go to the multipartite case, multipartite entanglement is much more powerful compared to classical results than if you are in the bipartite case. And this is particularly interesting because now that quantum information is so a hot topic that people are thinking about, I don't know, developing nets uh, by using some kind of quantum stuff. This is telling us that sharing quantum multipartite states is very, very powerful. It is much more powerful uh, than bipartite state in the this comparison. Okay, so I think this is all. Thank you very much for the attention. And... Yep. I don't know, uh, and I, I I haven't thought too much about that, but I was thinking about that, and I was not sure. So it's a very good question. Uh, because it's not compared with the separable. Uh, yeah, it's something that I don't know. Uh, since I, my like, like my motivation was LOCC. I mean, in a natural way, I I, I use separable strat plans between what I could use and what I could actually handle in terms of the result that I was looking for. So, if I consider separable strategies for some nice reasons. The norm that I obtain uh, is easier. With the PPT, I try to like um, 
study what kind of norm I would obtain. And I was not able to really get something which was very simple for me. But, but yeah, 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 I understand. Yeah, I understand. It's just, I agree. I, I tried. That is the reason why I tried. But uh, yeah, I didn't get anything. Uh, yeah, definitely. We could, I, I could, I, I could rethink about that and I can tell you why I couldn't. And maybe we can think if with PPT you can do something similar. You showed or you talked about there being sort of known examples of games with two outputs where the quantum phase exceeds the bound in the classical phase. Were, were there limits on the classical communication in these cases, or are, are the, is that true for like a two input phase only? I, I I think that in those cases, uh, th this is not uh, my result, eh, so I'm talking, but I think that in those cases, you can prove that the quantum value is strictly larger than even two-way communication. But what, because th I think this is, this can be uh, the deal from a result of Nicola Gisan and some other people. And I think that the key point is that if you don't restrict to the actual condition, you can really define a game so that in order to win the game, you can you you have to somehow create entanglement. So if you if they share an entangled state, of course they can create entanglement. That is super easy. But you will not be able to create entanglement even if you don't restrict any kind of classical communication. I think that yeah, sorry. To to input, you mean to a state? Uh, well, one state. Yeah, no, no, but be careful because now, I mean, in these kind of questions, the questions are quantum. Okay. Oh. So, 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 no, yeah, I mean, if, if you are in the classical case, if you are in with classical questions, you will not be able to improve classical communication. When, I mean, this this kind of result, when, when I'm saying that you could get something which is larger than one, that case, not one, it's in the quantum case. You, so the, quant the questions are quantum, so that classical communication is not clear if classical communication can't help at all. Yep. Here? here? Yeah. The, the, when, when I'm saying uh, by separate measurements, means that uh, the final measurement of Alice, Bob, and Charlie is going to be written in this way. Well, the only condition is that this is a PUBM in ABC. Yeah, definitely, definitely you can, definitely you can. But but yeah, but that is um, that is uh, even more general, right? Yeah, yeah. I haven't thought about that. Just going to tell you what I think. Um, um, I, my, my final answer is I don't know, but I I, I think that if you um, allow for uh, by separable by separable operations, in some sense, you are like um, you are like. You have convex combination of things so that each of them can be seen as a bipartite thing. And I kind of imagine, but this is this should be proof, that maybe in that case you can apply the previous result so that if you go to that setting, maybe that is too much. And quantum will not beat uh, this kind of operation. But this is very, very um, without thinking. I mean, it's just that I, when, when I have worked with uh, by separable correlations, at some point I have been able to see that you can actually prove 30. So you can actually use some results which are for bipartite, bipartite things, let's say. So here I, I could imagine that maybe if you use this kind of things, maybe you can reduce the problem to convex combination of things which are bipartite and then you can apply the previous result but of course this is not because the fact that you have convex combination is that in each of the combinations you have to 
to collect the spaces in a different way. So it's not clear that you can apply at the same time. But I, I would say that if I have to say yes or not, I would say that that is going to be too much. But if you want, we can think about that and we can see if, if, if that works. No, not at all. No. Because otherwise you can just apply the Yes, yes, but, but yeah. Yeah, no, but, but but here, have in mind that here, what you have to do in order to prove this result is that um, you want to upper bound the, the, the quantum bias, so the separable bias, and then you want to lower bound the quantum, the quantum bias. Right? So, so the fact that uh, the quantum is uh, much larger than the separable is just that you have to look for an upper bound of the separable bias, right? And in order to do that, I couldn't restrict to extreme points. So restricting to extreme points didn't help me at all. But I, did, I didn't even try. Maybe you want to try, and maybe you can apply this to the separable thing. It, it was not the way we, we upper bound the separable bias of the game. Have in mind that here, I mean, in this kind of results, I, don't, I haven't told you a precise game. Because in this kind of results, when you want to prove this upper bound, it's like, you construct sometimes, and this is, this is one particular case of that, um, some family of random games, and you prove that in some uh, probability, uh, they, they verify this. So I don't even have like a precise game for which I can prove, uh, so with, I can really compute the separable bias. It's just, I, I construct the game as, as at the same time as the quantum strategy so that that is large and at the same time the separable bias is small. So it's not so explicit so that you can check all the extreme points, at least not in the way I thought about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, here. Uh -huh. No, 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 much larger. It's strictly larger, but it cannot be much because, yeah. Well, it, it is. So, just a second, just a second. First of all, it's just strictly larger, not much larger. But, second point, have in mind that this new game is not an exhaust. So, the first theorem does not apply. It does not apply like that, but since, um, I mean, the, this theorem is for a short game, but you could apply it for more general games, but it's just that the constant will, will depend on the dimension finding the game, okay? So what I'm saying is that um, you could say, you could apply the first theorem to some games which are not a short, but then you have to pay a price of uh, in the dimension. Let's say it's like, let me put an example that you will understand perfectly. So if you, uh, you have Grothendix inequality in L1 tensor L1, okay? A classical Grothendix inequality tells you that in L1 tensor L1, two norms are equivalent. Now, if you want to apply that result to L1n of L infinity k, for instance, it does not apply there. It's just that if you pay a price in k in order to see L1 L infinity as a big L1, you can apply Grothendieck's inequality. In this case, it's somehow the same. You have a theorem for something which lives in a non-commutative L1 tensor L1. And general games are, in some sense, in L1 of L infinity. So as soon as this L infinity is not big, you can pay a price in order to obtain another constant, um, which depends, of course, on that dimension. But if the dimension is not very high, In fact, if you if you consider arbitrary uh, questions, I could say that you cannot prove this. No, I, I'm pretty sure that you cannot. I'm pretty sure that you cannot. But this is really about XOR, and in particular about it's just that the difference between XOR games and games with only uh, two outputs, even if it's not XOR, is not is you have to pay a price of S square root of two in the bias or something like that. 
but that square root of two can make the difference, even if this was constant k equal one, to make it larger than one. Yep. No, the in in, in the case of short games, the non-signaling. Yeah, no, it is is the same. In in case of general games. If it's not sure, the non-signaling is tricky. Actually, we are actually working on 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 the result on the about the non-signaling value of general quantum games. But if you are in the case of sure, it, it happens exactly the same as in the classical case. Non-signaling is everything. You in the classical case, every box is non-signaling at the end. So quantum in the case of quantum XOR games, it happens the same. You cannot improve uh, non-signaling. That is. That is, that is like quantum communication, like allowing quantum communication. You can do whatever you want for extra games.